Hello again. So I was thinking we might try something a little bit different for a Sunday today, uh, and that is rather than uh, going through a topic, a specific topic, or some sections of Scripture, that we would go verse by verse through the Word of God. I love doing that, and it's always a blessing to do that. So I figured we'd give it a shot for a, for a Sunday morning, so it'll be a little bit more like a, a study. Um, and if that's something that you enjoy, let me know, let, one way or the other. And uh, if that's what the Spirit leads, then maybe next time I'm up here, we'll just pick up from wherever we left off and just keep right on going. Um, so with that, go ahead, and if you've got a Bible with you, go ahead and get that on out. And uh, if not, we have some in front of some of the seats. Uh, otherwise, we'll have some words up here uh, like we normally do as well. Uh, get those opened up to uh, Numbers chapter 1. I'm kidding. That would be really hard for me. <laughs> I'm sure it would be fun. I, I, you know, you, you always find good stuff in God's uh, word, but uh, he put on my heart at least uh, James chapter 1. So we'll start there and, uh, and go through that. So first off, when you get into a new book in your Bible, you want to ask, you know, what, who wrote it, what they wrote it for, who they wrote it to, all of those basic kinds of questions. So the first thing is, is who wrote James? Well, the answer is James wrote James, right? Um, which seems pretty straightforward, except for uh, there's at least four Jameses that we, we know of. Uh, so we want to dig a little bit deeper with that. There's uh, James, the father of Judas, not Judas Iscariot, the other Judas. Uh, there is James, the son of Alphaeus. There's uh, John's brother and the son of Zebedee, uh, known as James the Less. He was the first apostle martyred. Um, but tradition points to James the Just. He was the brother of Jesus and Jude. He is the same James who led the church in uh, Acts 15. Um, and, and, and again, we point back that it was, it was Jesus' brother, which is really kind of interesting because if your mind's going the way mine is, you think back, I, I thought his brothers didn't believe, right? Because John 7, 5 uh, says of Jesus, not even his brothers believed in him, right? So what changed? All of a sudden, his brothers who don't believe in him, they're, they're writing Scripture, what we consider Scripture now. Um, and 1 Corinthians 15 might shed a little bit of light on this. As, as Paul is talking about the order of things with Jesus' death and resurrection, he starts to list uh, who Jesus saw. He says, uh, and that Jesus was buried and that he rose again the third day according to scriptures and that he was seen by Cephas, then by the twelve. After that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once. After that, he was seen by James, then all the apostles. So James is in there. So a lot of uh, people think that it makes perfect sense that maybe that was the point of James's conversion, or maybe shortly before there. But uh, certainly, uh, it changed Paul, right? Jesus came and saw him, not at the same time here, um, but it, it's life-changing. So he had an encounter, changed his heart, and he's a follower of Jesus. Uh, in fact, and again, from tradition, they used to call James camel knees because they said that he was constantly in prayer. He was constantly on his knees, and he had these big calluses on his knees because he was always on his knees in prayer. So that tells us a little bit about James. And as we open up, we'll see that he's actually he's writing, to, um, he's writing to the Jews, the new Jewish believers in Christ. Um, and at the time, there wouldn't have been really a whole lot of distinction because that's, that's who... Jesus came for. That's who believed Jesus. That, those were his followers. And of course, as the church grows, Gentiles are brought in as well. Um, so while James was writing to the Jewish people, he's also writing to the church. And so really, most if not all of this applies to all of us, not just the Jews. So we'll jump right on into this. It says, James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greetings. And scattered abroad, at this point, the Jews were all over the place. They were scattered. So this letter was meant to go far and wide. Verse 2 says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall in various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. 
But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. So the word patience here is something to key in on. I looked it up. The uh, Greek word is hupumona. Hupumone. 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 I have to say it a few times. Hupumone is the word. Um, It means endurance and perseverance. So the first thing we want to notice is we're not talking about be patient, as in sitting around doing nothing and waiting. It's not like you're in a doctor's office and you've got nothing to do but wait for your appointment to start. Not that kind of patience. It's an endurance and a perseverance. Keep going. Keep doing what you're doing, what you know is right, and keep doing it knowing that things will result. Be patient. Persevere and endure. He says that trials test our faith. And they do, right? Because when we have those difficult times, and none of us look forward to that, of course, but it shows us some things. It shows us where we lack so that we can do better. So when we fall, when we're trying really hard, and we fall, and we find ourselves yet again saying, Lord, I'm sorry, please forgive me, that shows us something. That shows us, first off, what we need forgiveness for, but it shows us where our weaknesses are, and it tests us so that we can change that, so we can do better next time, and so that we can persevere. Verse 5 says, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. I love that verse. I've probably told most of you by now, I remember early on in my walk, um, experiencing that verse when a Jehovah's Witness came knocking on my door and we talked for a little bit and he uh, explained that, uh, you know, the Holy Trinity wasn't really three, three persons and one God and that it was all separate beings. And I knew that wasn't right and I told him I knew that wasn't right and he said, well, because I couldn't, I couldn't point to a verse. I was still new. I, I couldn't point to a verse to show him as much as I wanted to. And he said, well, pray about it. And, 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 you know, I'll swing by. We'll talk next week. I said, okay, I'll I'll do that. And I prayed. And all of a sudden, it was like a light bulb went on. And I turn on the TV, and there's a preacher preaching on the Holy Trinity. I pop open my Bible devotional. Would you know, this week is the Trinity week. I listen to, you know, a preacher on the radio on the way in. He's He's explaining how we know that Jesus is God himself. All because I prayed that the Lord would give me wisdom, help me. I know what's right here, Lord, but help me to see it. And boy, did I have a lot of verses and a lot of things to say the next week. Uh, He didn't come back after that, which is fine, but it helped to test me. It was great. So when we're going through tough times, we need wisdom. We need that wisdom, and God is our source. We ask God. First step to asking God anything, but especially for wisdom, always, always, always is prayer and scripture. Open up your Bible, start reading through any general area you think that maybe deals with the topic that uh, that you're thinking about. A lot of Bibles have these really neat um, uh, indexes that'll tell you for these different things, see these different verses. You can look those things up online and find the verses to go to, but open up your scripture because when the Lord speaks to us more often than not, it's through his word in scripture and pray. Ask him, get on your knees and pray that, uh, that he would grant you wisdom. And to a lesser extent, seek out spiritual advice from your mentors, from people at church. Now, I only say to a lesser extent because if you're struggling with something and you need wisdom and you come to me and say, well, what do I do? The first thing I'm going to ask you is, have you prayed about it and have you searched through scriptures about it? Because if you haven't, go do that and then come back and we'll talk. Not because I don't want to talk to you about it, but because God knows better than me or anybody else here and we need to seek his wisdom first. So those are all the different things that we can do to seek God's wisdom, but it comes from him. And it says, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach. So some interesting words there. Liberally, um, of course, is pretty straightforward and simple. He'll give to excess. 
He's not going to withhold wisdom from you. If you're asking him, Lord, what do I do in this situation? He'll answer. Um, like I said, I didn't get some quiet whisper about the Holy Trinity. All of a sudden, it was like a fire hose was turned on, and it was everywhere. He gave me liberally wisdom. But without reproach, that's one of those words that if somebody uses it, it's because they're a Christian and because they read it in the Bible, not because we use that word anymore. We don't. Without reproach. So I looked that up, and the, the, the word was unabradeth. That wasn't very helpful either. That was probably a little bit worse than reproach. What's unabradeth? Onedizo. Onedizo. To revile or taunt. That's what that means. So, without reproach would be without taunting. So, how many of you have gone to somebody asking for advice or how do I do this? I can't get the computer to work. How do I do it? And maybe they're agitated with you. <laughs> Come on, you should know that. Your, your kids can do that. You know, why are you having trouble with that? Come on. God's not going to do that. We can ask Him for wisdom, and He's not going to hold it against us. He's not going to make us feel bad for asking for that wisdom. He will give it to us liberally and without reproach. He's not going to make us feel bad for asking. But there's a condition on the way we seek God for knowledge or for anything else. We find that in verse 6. It says, But let him ask in faith with no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For let, no, for let not that mean, let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double minded man, unstable. In all his ways. So he says, ask God for knowledge, but the condition is when we ask God for anything, we expect an answer. We don't expect he's going to give us everything we want. We don't expect he's going to give us the answer we want, but he will hear us and he will answer us. We have the expectation that he's capable of answering the prayers. Because if we're not, it says we're like a wave of the sea tossed by the wind. When we doubt God, we don't know what to expect. If I go before the Lord in prayer, I think maybe he'll hear me, maybe he won't. What's the point? Where's the, the peace in that if I don't know? Maybe I'm so messed up that I think that he'll answer the opposite. Like he'll do something that I don't want him to do. Like maybe I shouldn't pray with him at all. Sometimes we hit points in our life where we, where we get exactly that or we don't believe that God can do it, or we don't believe God will do it. And he warns us against that because it makes us like a wave of the sea tossed by the wind. We're all over the place. We don't know what to do. And we worry. We worry because we don't have faith in God who is in control. What causes worry? When we're scared of something, when we're concerned about something, when we're I'm not looking forward to tomorrow because this might happen. It's when something unpleasant happens and we're not sure. If we don't have trust in God, we don't have that assurance that he's in control. Nothing's going to happen that he won't let happen. We're double-minded even. We're asking God without faith. Lord, would you give me knowledge even though I don't think you're really going to? That's double-minded. That's, that's my problem, Right? It makes us unstable with no rock to stand on. Because when we realize that he's God, that he's going to answer, that he's going to give us knowledge that we seek liberally and without reproach, we're not afraid of the outcome because we know it's in his will. We know somebody way greater and way more powerful than us is in control. Somebody's got the ship going where it needs to go. I don't need to worry about that. I don't need to worry about the next wave or the, the wind or the ship wrecking because God's got that. He's in control. And so I can have that peace and ask him, Lord, what do you want me to do? What can I do? It makes it so much less that we have to be concerned about. So the next verse shifts topics a little bit. And as you'll notice here, James is, uh, it's very much 
practical knowledge, practical information for believers. And so he's going through and really showing us, so you're a follower of Jesus now, so what does that look like? And that's one of the first places I like to go, is what does a follower of Christ look like? You go to James, and he'll tell you exactly what it looks like, what we're supposed to do. And so verse 9, he gets into this. He says, let the lowly brother glory in his exaltation, but the rich in his humility, because as a flower of the field, he will pass away. For no sooner has the sun risen with a burning heat than it withers the grass. Its flower falls and its beautiful appearance perishes. So the rich man also will fade away in his pursuits. This one took a little bit because he didn't quite... I had to look through it and just really pour over that and read that. And here's what it means. There's the lowly brother and there's the rich. We're comparing, right? So the lowly brother is somebody who is poor. They're in poverty. They're struggling. They're weak, maybe poor health. And he's saying that they are to glory in exaltation. So when somebody in poverty ends up with more wealth, ends up with a meal that they were not sure where it was going to come from, ends up in better times, they're exalted and they're to glory in that, be happy with that. The rich, who are healthy and wealthy and content already, are to glory in humiliation, in the hard times, in the humbling. They're to glory in those trials, right? Because remember, those trials test our faith. So here's the key, because I think it's easy enough for us to think, if I'm coming from poverty or some sort of a downtime, and the Lord blesses me and removes that and makes things better, that's easy to glory in, right? We don't need to really study that too much, because that's just, that's what we do. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. But what about when we're the opposite, and we come to that time of of trials? Well, here's the key. If we identify with our wealth and our success and our health, When it fades, we fade, because that's what our identity is wrapped up in. If I am my career, if I am my paycheck, if I am my good health, what happens when those things are taken away? Because inevitably, they can and will be taken away. So what happens to me? I go with it. I fade as well. But if my identity is in Jesus, I've lost nothing, right? Right? If my identity is in Jesus and those things are taken away, Jesus is still there because he's not going to be taken away. He can't be taken away from me. And so I go through times of trials and I can learn from that and it's unpleasant, but I'm intact and I I get to make it through those times because Jesus is what's really important. So he gives us another little tidbit here. Chapter, or verse 12 says, Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. So first off, the key here is temptation. So again, we'll look that one up. Perazu. I got it right the first time. Perazu. Just had to prepare myself. Perazu is the, uh, the Greek word there, temptation. That's to try, to make trial of, to test for the purpose of ascertaining his quality or what he thinks or how he will behave himself. Also, to try or test one's faith, virtue, or character by enticing to sin. So there's kind of two separate meanings of temptation there. One is simply to try somebody. You say that you love the poor. Okay, well, let's, uh, let's see what you do when you get uh, a bonus on your paycheck. And so you get that and you take a look and see. Is that temptation there to take that bonus and spend it on something selfish? Or are you really by your word and you're going to take that and you're going to give some of that to the poor? That would be a way to, to try somebody, to tempt somebody in that way. Um, the other would be something straight out sinful because that's not necessarily sinful for you to take uh, yeah, a bonus or something that you've earned and spend it on yourself, right? Not necessarily. Depends on the circumstances. But the other temptation is to tempt you to sin. 
You struggle with, say, alcohol. What happens if somebody drops you off outside of a bar? That's a different type of temptation, right? That's a temptation to do something wrong, not just to test and see what you're made of, but to put you into a situation that you don't want to be in and that you battle with. So temptations test us. And again, like testing our faith, when we fail, we find where we need the work. We find which temptations have hold of us. But when we endure, we prove our faith and we're blessed by God. He will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Blessed is the man who endures temptation. Crown of life. Is it a literal crown? Maybe. Maybe not. But we're promised a reward. If that means that I'm going to get a literal crown when I get to meet my Lord, I'm going to love that crown. If it means that I'm going to get some sort of a, a, a blessing, you know, above and beyond for doing that, I'm going to love that. It doesn't really matter whether it's literal or not. What it is, is it's a reward. So we're rewarded for our perseverance and for our uh, making it through temptation and not falling into sin. He expands on this. He says, let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. These are some important concepts to understand. God cannot be tempted by evil. So the first place I go to is, well, Luke chapter 4. Verse 1 says, then Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness being tempted for 40 days by the devil, and in those days he ate nothing. And afterward, when they had ended, he was hungry. So how was Jesus tempted if it says God cannot be tempted by evil? Well, for one, it was a test. It was the testing part. It wasn't the Jesus longing after something sinful and struggling not to do it. It was more along the lines of testing his words. These things are available. Is he going to do them? So it kind of shifts to that other definition. There was no possible outcome other than for Jesus to pass those tests. He was without sin, without blemish, right? So while he was being tempted, as in making those things available, he wasn't being tempted as in necessarily desiring to, to do those things. James, um, James uses the word uh, differently as well. Um, in verse, let's skip ahead here so we can see the whole thing. He says, let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself corrupt anyone. And it goes on and says, but each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. So that clarifies how James is using the word tempted. He's talking about being tempted with sin, things that we want, and being enticed. I don't think Jesus was being enticed. He was being tried, for sure, to see if he really was who he said he would be. Satan was trying to see if he could get him to, to mess up and ruin his plan. But, but was, he, was it really going to happen? Of course not. So we get a better definition of the word So it also says, nor does he himself tempt. So God allows us to be tempted and tested. Satan and his demons are even allowed to tempt us and test us. The whole book of Job, it's an awful lot about that, right? Ways that uh, God allowed things to happen, that Satan was trying to, trying to prove a point, really. But verse 14 shows us We are best at being tempted without the help of Satan and his demons. Imagine that and think about that. What if, rather than saying the devil made me do it, I realize I have a sin nature and, you know, my, my body likes to do things that it shouldn't be doing, but my spirit, that's what allows me not to. It says, but each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed 
Then when the desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. So notice the order there, too. Because this is the other thing that will get people. Um, followers of, of God thinking, boy, the, this temptation is, it's a sin. Well, did you give in to it? No, but I'm tempted. I'm tempted to. So I'm sinning. I'm sinning in my mind. And I think that goes a little too far because if we take a look at the order here, a few things happen first before it's sin, right? We're tempted by our own desires. We're fallen. We have a sinful nature. And so we have desires that God did not put there for us. We have those desires that came after the fall. They're not of God. They're not things that are good for us. We know what those are. We all have our own lists, things that we desire that we shouldn't and that we should never go after. It says, then we're enticed. So maybe thinking about it, maybe seeing that thing that I know that I want, but, I, but God doesn't want for me. So now I see it. Now I think about it. Maybe I encounter it when I'm out and around. And so that's being enticed. And then that desire grows. Now all of a sudden, it's no longer just in the back of my mind as something I try to avoid. Now it's front and center, right? That, uh, that sin, all of a sudden, you're driving down the road, and there it is. It's, it's waving at you. So not only does it come to your mind and, and you're enticed by it, but now you're thinking about it and you're focusing on it. And then after that, gives birth to sin. What do you do with that? What do you do with the temptation, with the enticement and the desire that's growing in you? Do you turn that action into something sinful or not? Because it can give birth to sin. And then the sin grows. And of course, we know where sin brings you, sin gives birth to death. And so then we're stuck back into that cycle again where we're before our Lord repenting so that that death has no effect on us. Temptation itself is not the sin. Desire is not the sin. But they quickly lead there. And oftentimes before you even realize that's what's going on. So when do we fight that? Do we fight that when it's in our face, off the side of the road waving at us as we go by? Or do we fight that early on? by conditioning our thoughts, by avoiding maybe where that'll show up. I've heard stories, I'm sure they're true, it's sad, I'm sure, of, uh, of, of alcoholics. Um, the, the key to being a successful alcoholic is realizing that doesn't change and you stop drinking because you can't handle that. And people are very successful at that. Some of them, unfortunately, think, well, I've got that under, under control now. And they wind up uh, facing things that they shouldn't be facing. So rather than avoiding places where liquor is sold or where people drink it socially, they're intentionally going out there. And unfortunately, I've heard stories of some of them saying, oh no, I'm going out and I'm preaching the word of God. I'm doing God's work. No, you're not. You are setting yourself up to fail because stopping that sin means avoiding those first several steps that will get you there. And if you can do it there, it's so much easier than when you're right in the middle of it and it's in your face. You avoid those things. Jesus said, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off, right? So cut something off. Not your hand, but, you know, if there's something that causes you to sin and maybe it's got a geographic location, take a different route and drive around it. Maybe it's a person, avoid that person. You know, whatever that thing is, you know what, the, the, what triggers the sin, you avoid them at that level, so before it manifests into sin. I love how James lays that order out, because then we can see it. We see, wow, it, it starts all the way back here before it's sin, and it gives us an earlier place to just nip it in the bud. So he continues on. Verse 16, he says, Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren, every good and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. So God does not tempt us with sin. Uh, and by believing that he does, we're, we're being deceived. He does bless us. Everything that is good and perfect comes from God. Temptations are not good and perfect, right? You will allow us to be tested. But you're never going to go and pray and the Lord's going to answer you by giving you temptation. 
Because that's not a good and perfect gift. That's not good at all, right? So again, he's our rock. We know that he's good. We know that what he gives us is good. There's no variation. God is consistent. We don't get temptations one minute and blessings another. That's the other thing. He's not like us. You know, maybe, some, maybe people that you love very much, maybe really good people, they, you know, they're, they're really nice, they're, they're serving, and then sometimes have bad days, right? They're just grouchy and say something mean or respond in a mean way, right? God doesn't do that. We're not going to pray to him and find out that he just answered us on his off day where he's feeling grumping at us. He's the same. So we don't have to worry about that like we do from people, right? God's different. He's the same. Verse 18 says, Of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. So of his own will, we didn't have to ask. Nobody had to ask. Nobody had to convince God to give us salvation. Nobody had to tell God, if you give them salvation, I'll give you this. Right? Again, he's very different than we are, isn't he? We are brought forth into life by the word of God. So here comes probably, oh, there's so many of them. We'll call it my favorite verse in this, uh, in this chapter. 19. So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, for the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. There's so much in there and so much we can learn about that. This is our response to the good and perfect gift of salvation, is to behave like followers of Jesus. Swift to hear. Make listening to other people the highest priority. When there's communication going on, my job is to listen and to hear everything and to be able to, to bring that on in. My mouth is shut. I'm not thinking about how I'm going to respond. I'm not, uh, I'm not reacting even necessarily to what you're saying. I'm taking it all in. I'm making sure that I'm being a good listener. He listens to us. It's only fair that we listen to each other the same way. Swift to hear, but slow to speak. Much less of a priority. Priority number one is listening and bringing it all in. Then after that, after that's been achieved properly, then I can speak. Only after listening. Even better yet, speak only when needed. Who am I serving by speaking? Is it achieving something? It's funny, we get into these weird habits where we'll sit there and we'll talk and we'll say things just to say things. It's not helping anybody, it's not making anybody feel any better, it's not solving a problem, it's just words coming out of my mouth because now I'm on a roll, right? We, we do that. It says be slow to speak, consider what we're saying, whether or not it needs to be said, and consider how we're going to say it. So that gives us the opportunity of thinking internally before I say it, is this going to hurt somebody, is this going to upset somebody? Is this something that God wants me to say? And if I'm slow to speak, that means when I'm about to come out and spew out something God does not want me to say, I can stop myself before I do it because I'm slow to speak. If I do it fast, there's no way. I'm not going to catch it. it. I mean, we've all been there, right? You, you're fast to speak, and so then you say it, and then you hear it, and you're like, whoa, did I just say that out loud? Oh, no. And you can't take it back because it's already been said, because I was too fast to speak. And then we're to be slow to anger, slow to wrath. So that's the other part. We're hearing, we're taking things in, and sometimes when we're listening, we're getting pretty angry. Things are being said that aren't very nice, right? And that's where we need to be slow to wrath. We need to be patient. We need to take a lot of things into consideration. We need to assume innocence of what's being said. 1 Corinthians 13.5, right? It says, love thinks no evil. I love that verse because that means when I'm considering my response, when I'm considering whether I should even be getting angry, I first have to see, 
Could they mean something else? Could they have said it in an, an inappropriate way or a wrong way? Did they, maybe, did they maybe speak before they thought about it, right? And give grace. Maybe they did, but maybe they didn't know it was going to hurt me that bad or make me upset. Is it worth being angry over? Be slow to anger. And it says, our wrath does not produce the righteousness of God. That's why we want to be slow to anger, because our anger rarely solves something for the Lord. Think about it. Think about the last time you were angry. What caused you to be angry, and why were you angry? Was it selfish in nature? I'm angry the TV is so loud because it's hurting my ears, and it's making it so I can't think. I'm angry that you said something because it made me feel like this. There's no place for righteous anger if we're angry about something that happened to us, right? That's not to say that we never get angry when we, you know, obviously there are things that can happen that should, we should be angry about. But in general, the emotion of anger that builds up in our hearts is because something happened and we don't like it because of our own reasons, not because we're solving anything for the Lord by getting angry like that. And we'll go ahead and leave that here. And again, let me know if you'd like. We'll pick it right up from here next time uh, I'm up here. Let's, uh, let's pray first. Father God, we, uh, we thank you so much for your word and how amazingly rich it is. We, uh, we thank you from all the various different perspectives that, uh, that we get throughout your word, all the different authors and, and just the different ways that you worked in them that, uh, that they can show us all these things. We thank you, Lord, that, uh, that we have those instructions, and we pray, Lord, that you would help us to follow them, that, uh, that we would be quick to listen and slow to speak and slow to anger, that we would do those things, if nothing else, just simply out of our obedience and devotion to you. And uh, Lord, we thank you again for all that you show us in Jesus' name, amen. So, <laughs> thank you. It is Communion Sunday.